What's up, everybody? Welcome to your next unit of CPS. In this unit, we're going to be talking about chemical bonds. This is chapter chapter 18 in your book. We are going to start with section one, which is stability in bonds. So, without further ado, let's keep trucking. First, let's talk a little bit about a compound. We've already talked about these somewhat. Compounds... Um, combine different atoms. And we know different atoms can be uncombined elements such as copper, like we find copper wiring, or oxygen gas that we breathe all around us. But these elements, especially if we take sulfur into a bond, we can, we can put these three elements together through chemical means to make a compound. All right, The Statue of Liberty started out as pure copper. All right, but over time, it reacted with sulfur and oxygen in the air to get that green patina that we now see today. This green patina, and you could sometimes see this on pennies, is unlike any of the three elements it's made of. It has its own distinct properties that are different than pure copper, pure sulfur, or pure oxygen. When we do something like this, when we have a compound, we define that compound by a chemical formula using those same symbols that we used on the periodic table to talk about the elements. A chemical formula tells us exactly the number of atoms of each element in the compound. All right, I'm going to start with something really familiar here, H2O, which is water. All right, you got two H's and one O together, all right? You have the chemical symbol for the H, for the hydrogen, you have the chemical symbol for the O, and then there's this little two down here for the H known as a subscript. That means there's two H's, all right? This is why it's really important to watch your capital and lowercase letters when writing your elemental symbols. The subscripts, as we said earlier, will tell you how many atoms of each element are in the compound. All right, if a symbol has no subscript, we assume there is one atom of that element. So going back to H2O, there's a little two for the H, so that means there's two hydrogen, and there's nothing for the O, so there's one oxygen. All right, here are some very common chemicals, all right? Sand is silicon dioxide, a silicon and two oxygens. Sugar, cane sugar, sucrose, has 12 carbons, 22 hydrogens, and 11 oxygens. This is like the sugar that you, you know, would bake with. Vinegar is a type of acid called acetic acid. It has two carbons, two oxygens, and four total hydrogens. It's written this way because this is the way an organic chemist would write it. This COOH group identifies an organic acid. All right, you don't really need to worry about that. Alcohol, at least the kind of alcohol that your parents may partake in, is known as ethanol. It has two carbons, five hydrogens and then an oxygen and a hydrogen. Again, this extra hydrogen here is put next to the oxygen because of how it's bonded. The other five hydrogens are all bonded to the carbon. I grabbed this right out of your book, so you can see there was a little typo. This H, this H should be capitalized. Right. You can see some other common names, their chemical names and their formula and see how everything works. What you should be able to do from the formula is pull out how many of each type of atom there is. In the case of milk of magnesia, right here we have an OH in parentheses. This too gets distributed to everything in the parentheses like it would in math. So there's one magnesium, two O's, and two H's. And it's written like this again, because of how the the atoms are actually bonded together, but we're not going to worry about that right now. The whole reason 
atoms undergo these bonds is for atomic stability. All right, it all goes back to those electric forces between electrons and protons. The negative electrons and the positive protons are attracted to each other. All right, and then that also means that electrons from one atom can be attracted to the protons of a different atom, and that all plays a role. All right, the noble gas gases, the last column on the periodic table that starts with helium, those are unusually unstable. They are the only essentially non-reactive elements on the table. And we don't really see any compounds from these noble gas atoms because those compounds are actually less stable than the original noble gases. One of the things to, that helps us look at chemical stability is to look at something called an electron dot diagram. That is where you have the symbol of the element, and then you put dots to represent the outermost electrons, or the valence electrons. These outer energy shell electrons are the ones that are involved in bonding. And almost every element on the periodic table wants to have eight electrons in their outer shell. There's a couple of weird ones, like hydrogen and helium, that only want to, because that first shell of electrons can only hold two. So helium with two electrons here has a complete outer shell because helium can only hold two. But most other things want eight. So notice how as you go from helium to radon, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon all have eight dots around it. This means they have a completely full shell. If we look at some other elements, hydrogen only contains one electron. We know that the first shell wants two. So if hydrogen already has one and it wants two, it's going to want a second one. So hydrogen is not full. Hydrogen is more stable when it is part of a compound because now it will fill up and essentially get a second dot in one way or another. And that's what we'll be talking about this whole unit, is how hydrogen and other elements can get those extra dots, or how they can get rid of dots if they want to get rid of them instead, how they can get rid of electrons. If we contrast this to helium, helium already has two electrons. Right? It's in that first shell so it only wants those two electrons. It can't hold any more. It would need to start a new shell to get more electrons. So helium rarely forms compounds. And essentially, unless we do crazy stuff to helium and put it under ridiculous temperatures and pressures, we'd never see helium combine. And so we use helium all by itself as a gas. It's an inert gas. It's what we use in balloons and blimps now, which is a lot safer than when we used to use hydrogen, which is highly reactive. If we look at other elements, and, and I'm just looking at groups 1, 2, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17... 18 noble gases, we can see that a pattern emerges, right? Everything in group one only has one electron in its outer shell. If I drew potassium below sodium here, it would have two full shells and then one electron in its outer shell. In group two, there's always two electrons in the outer shell. Group 13 has three electrons. Group 14 has four. All right, you might be saying, well, what about groups three through 12, 3 through 12 are weird, all right? They're in the middle of the table there. They do their own kind of thing. They interact funky with other elements because of where the electrons are. But for groups 1, 2, 13 through 18, the last digit of the group number tells you how many outer electrons they have. All right, and everything in the same group has the same number of outer electrons. The only difference is helium. Helium is up here above neon. Helium only has two electrons, but that's because its outer shell can only hold two electrons.
So, how does hydrogen fill up, or any of these other elements we talked about, but how does it fill up its outer shell to become stable? It can gain electrons, it can lose electrons, it can do other things with electrons, and that is one of the things we will be discovering as this unit goes on. All right, Atoms will do almost anything to get an extra or to get a full outer shell. They will take electrons from something else, they will give away their electrons, thus leaving them with a complete inner shell. When the outer shell vanishes, it becomes the, the, the inner shell becomes the outer shell. Um, or some elements will start to share electrons amongst each other and, and kind of treat those shared electrons as their own. So as a result of this giving and taking and sharing elements in a bond, all the elements in the bonds end up becoming stable or achieving a stability that they do not have on their own. If I look at more of an example here, here I have sodium. All right, sodium has two electrons in the first shell eight electrons or a full second shell, it's also a full first shell, and one electron all alone in third shell. Well, sodium should have one electron. It is in group one. All right, it is in the third row of the table. That's why there's three shells. It's amazing how well that table works. If I look at its good buddy chlorine, all right, chlorine has two electrons in its first shell. All right, it's also in row three of the table. It has a full second shell. And then in its third shell, it has seven outer electrons. It's part of group 17, so it should have seven outer electrons. Well, seven is one away from eight. So what we're going to see happening here is this lone electron from sodium is going to give, be given away to that open spot in chlorine. And what we will see happen is we will see that extra electron kind of go in there and then get deleted from the sodium. If you now look, sodium's new outer shell is right here and it has those eight electrons. Two, four, six, eight in that outer shell. It got rid of the third shell altogether, so that second shell became its outer shell. In the case of chlorine, chlorine added this extra electron here to give itself one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons in its outer shell, which is now completely full. That is one way in which bonding can work. And we've got a lot more to talk about bonding. This is a type of bonding called nionic bond. That is what we're going to spend the next section of notes on when we get to it. But we're going to kind of just sit here and come up with this and look at this and, and, and reflect on this idea of bonding for stability for a little while. The overall takeaway here is that when atoms gain, lose, or share electrons, an attraction forms between those atoms. This attraction is a chemical bond. A chemical bond is the force holding the atoms together in a compound. All right, Sodium gave up its electron to chlorine. All right, because sodium got rid of one electron, it has a positive charge. Remember, electrons have negative charge. Chlorine took an extra electron, so it got a negative charge. So that positive and negative of those two atoms, those charged atoms, or ions as they are called, is now attracting them even closer. And they are both nice, happy, and stable. As we go through chapter 18 we will get into ionic bonds we'll get into covalent bonds and we'll also talk about how to write formulas and name formulas the naming and writing of some of those formulas that we saw earlier 
But that is all I have for you now. If you, you know, want a little more information on this, go ahead. Read Chapter 18, Section 1 in your book. Uh, contact your teacher in whichever way is best. Stop by their office hours or their flex hours or whatever hours your teacher might have to help you answer questions. And that is it. Have a good night or day.